I honour the place in you where pure water resides, the place of truth, love and bliss. And I recognise when I'm in that place in me and you're in that place in you, that we are one. We've learnt that water is the matter and matrix of life and therefore pure water exists somewhere in all of us. Water is the ultimate solvent that, that connects all of life and today I want to talk about the connections between water, wellness and wealth and the deep inner well of our being. Now this talk will present a big picture that includes life, the universe and everything, including evolution and entropy and how all life exists at the interface between water and earth. But before I start, I just want to ask if you'd like to share a bath with me. Well, what about with your neighbour or with everyone in the room? Because I see the world in terms of bathing. And in my view, we all share the same bath. And right now, humans are soiling the bath water. The amount of water on Earth has been relatively fixed for millennia, yet pollution is increasing exponentially and clean, flowing water is becoming a rare and diminishing resource. There are alternatives to fossil fuels, yet there is no alternative to water. Water is an issue of life and death. Now, Indigenous people have always known this, and Grandma Agnes Baker Pilgrim, who's the chair chairperson of the International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers, she told me that we are all water babies and that water should be everyone's concern, that, and that without water, we all die, all life dies. Water is precious and we need to give thanks to water. I've also learned from Professor Pollack that 99% of the molecules in my body are water. It therefore seems obvious that water, wellness and wealth are connected. And our language tells us this. A well refer refers to a natural water source. Being well means expressing our true nature. Being wealthy is a property of having wealth. As I've said, I want to present a big picture. And I want to tell you how I, can, I see that water is the divine spirit that lies at the deep inner well of our being. And that when we tune into our essence through meditation, we're actually tuning into the biggest living water structures on Earth, which are the global rainforests. And I want to tell you how water comes alive at hydrothermal vents and how these vents, geothermal springs, are not only the original fountains of life, but they, they are also the fountains of wellness and wealth, and they continue to sustain all life on Earth and fuel human innovation, as well as biological innovation. And I want to tell you that when water flows well, wellness follows, and that while pollution is inevitable, I believe that worldwide wellness is possible if we treat the Earth's waters as a single flowing system and focus on closing the loops on our waste streams and delivering clean, flowing water to all while exporting entropy out to the solar system. So I want to share a lot. And for me, this is not just an academic presentation. Water for me is very personal and intimate. And I want to hear, I'm here to give a presentation that's very different from any academic presentation I've ever given. I must admit, I love water. And I'm here to give the presentation of my life. Thus, while I'm going to speak about evolution of life, all life on Earth, I'm arrogant and self-centred enough to make this talk all about me. After all, I have spent my life immersed in this topic, literally. As I said, I love water and I especially love bathing. My mother, who's here today, she'll attest to the amount of time I spent in the bath growing up. And as far back as I can remember, I've always loved soaking in water. It's as if as soon as I was born, I wanted to recreate the conditions within the womb. I apparently also wanted to be born under a water sign, and I emerged four weeks premature on the afternoon of Friday, 20th, 1964. And I was born at a bridge in time, and I think that set the pattern for my life, which has been a bridge. For me, my birth represented the interface between the watery environment of the womb and life out on Earth in the air. And while this is true of all of us, the time of my birth felt especially auspicious. I was born on the autumn equinox at the cusp of night and day, week and weekend, summer and winter, the beginning and end of the zodiac cycle, and the border of the X generation and the boomer generation. I was also born at what I believe is a turning point in human evolution, 
And so far in my life, I've seen the world's population double and the global computing power at the time of my birth end up in my pocket. I've always felt blessed by the time of my birth and I thought the universe was plotting to make me happy by exposing me to a world of diverse and exciting change. And this feeling was reinforced when the United Nations declared my birthday International Day of Happiness and by the fact that I grew up in the lucky country of Australia in the city of Melbourne, which I was always told is the world's most multicultural city. I therefore not only grew up in a bridge in time, I also grew up in a place of British many different cultures and experiences. Now, Melbourne's a festival city with strong European, American, Asian and indigenous influences without any one of them dominating. Melbourne also has diverse environments and water experiences. And living in Melbourne, I was always constant, you know, conscious of the weather, which ranges from chilling frosts to sweltering 45 degree heat waves, and with four distinct seasons, which are notorious for sometimes occurring in one day. I've also personally seen the devastating impacts of fires, floods, droughts, hail, gale force winds and water restrictions. And I've enjoyed many of Melbourne's water features, including its river, its bay, its nearby surf beaches, snow fields, lakes, mountain springs, hot springs, and all of which have played important roles in my life. It was easy to love water growing up in the bayside suburb of Garden Vale. And as a child, I couldn't get enough of Jacques Cousteau documentaries. I was actually fascinated by the oceans and underwater life. And I recall sitting at school, watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. But the thing that struck, struck me most about the moonwalk was learning that we knew more about the moon than we did about the oceans. And I believe that that is still true today. And later as a teenager, I remember when the submersible Alvin first discovered hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, and it was first realised that life could exist without the sun. Thus, I was instilled with this feeling that the oceans held deep and important mysteries that filled me with awe. And when people asked me if I wanted to be an astronaut when I grew up, I said, no, I want to be a marine biologist. However, when I finished school, I thought, I want to have the healthiest and happiest life, and I thought that studying medicine would teach me this. I thought a career in medicine would teach me everything there was to know about life, including birth and death and everything in between, and therefore I could learn how to be as healthy as possible. I've told you I'm self-centred. I didn't go into medicine wanting to heal sick people. I went into medicine trying to learn how to have the happiest, healthiest life for myself. I actually thought that pleasure could be medicinal. And I envisaged creating pleasure clinics where people could expand their capacity for feeling good. However, when I discussed this with my fellow medical students, they asked me, was I talking about an opium den or a brothel? Well, I told them that I saw pleasure clinics as places that would use the latest technology to analyse everything about a person and design real and virtual experiences to make them feel as alive as possible and help them achieve maximal wellness. And this dream has led me on a personal quest that has led me to complete a medical degree and two PhDs and write many books and dozens of academic articles of bridge different fields. I actually feel most comfortable being the bridge between different disciplines. And I've spent the last three decades studying Western medicine, Eastern medicine, physiology, psychology, science, spirituality, electrical and computer systems engineering, medical informatics, atmospheric electrodynamics, nutrition, yoga, herbal medicine, detoxification and lifestyle. All with a focus on wellness, which I see as a trans discipline. I now have actually have the dream job of researching health retreats, herbal teas, saunas, human performance and hot springs. Bathing is therefore still a major focus of my life and it's great to be here in Bulgaria where hot springs are so prevalent and in the next few weeks I hope to go around Europe to continue this hot springs research. Yet while I've traversed a convoluted path, I've remained focused on bringing different disciplines together and that keeps, and the bridge between different disciplines keeps me focused on the interface between water and earth and the basic fundamental laws of physics. And one of the first things I learnt in science were the laws of thermodynamics and that the first law states that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, but only converted from one to the other. I saw this reflected in, reflected in spiritual science with the statement that all is one, and understood that it's impossible to add or subtract from the wholeness of the universe, and that any separation is actually either an illusion or a transformation. I saw this being consistent with monotheism, which speaks of a single, infinite deity, 
and also with Eastern philosophy, which describes the Tao um, as the, or the way of the universe as incomprehensible and inseparable. The Tao that can be spoken of is not the true Tao. And in bathing terms, I saw that the quantity of bath water is fixed. Indeed, there's only this much water on Earth. And only 3% of this water is fresh. And I don't know if you can see it there, because most of the fresh water is frozen, but that's the amount of liquid fresh water, that little dot. Therefore, our bath water is very limited, and that I share the same bath water with all people and all animals on Earth, including all life that has ever been. I also learned that the second law of thermodynamics states that entropy or disorder must increase in any isolated system. And this sort of confused me at first, is how can you have an isolated system if you cannot add or subtract from the whole? Nevertheless, I realised you can't get useful work from a perpetual motion machine, and that entropy leads to heat, expansion, the redshift of light, and the loss of useful energy. In bathing terms, I saw this as meaning that the quality of bath water deteriorates unless it's flowing. And I saw this reflected in medicine with the statement, stasis is the basis for infection. I also saw this the cosmic correlates of entropy reflected in the physiolo physiological correlates of inflammation, which, which I learned in medical school as calor, rubor, tumor, dolor, functio lasa, or heat, redness, swelling, pain, and loss of function. I therefore saw a link between physics and physiology and considered pain a conscious correlate of entropy. I also found this consistent with Eastern medicine and the idea that life itself is the beginning of all Ill illness, written in the Yellow Emperor's classic. And also the first tenet of Buddhism, which is life is pain. Thus I saw that science and spirituality were consistent and both attested to the fact that being alive and separate from the environment naturally produces entropy. I now see these basic laws reflected in the properties of life and water. Thus, while water is the ultimate solvent and the matter and matrix of life that connects all living things, at the interface between water and earth, or minerals and hydrophilic substance, you know, barriers, water creates the illusion of separation by forming exclusion zones. And in this act of separation, water seems to defy the second law of thermodynamics by converting background thermal infrared radiation into coherent, interfacial, structured water that creates order, structure, potential energy and movement. In other words, exclusion zone water has the properties of life, and the story of life is therefore the story of water dancing to the tune of solids, which is the story of separation and connection, and what I see as a stormy, four billion year long love affair between water and earth. Now I think it's easy to see water as divine. Indeed, water is pervasive throughout the universe, and may even be the most abundant substance in the universe. Yet the universe is not very wet. Liquid water, it seems, is rare, and only survives at the interface between heaven and earth, right here where we are, right there. And the universe is caught up in a continual process of transformation, and for billions of years our solar system has been spinning around the galactic centre, with the earth spinning in a vortex around the sun in what they call the Goldilocks zone, which is a range of orbits around a star that's not too hot and not too cold, so that water can exist in a liquid state. However, being the right distance away from the sun is not enough. To stay liquid and not be blown off into space, water needs to be separated from the heavens and protected from the solar wind by the Earth's magnetosphere, which forms a massive force field that deflects cosmic rays and channels charged particles towards the, towards the poles, producing the auroras. Now, without the magnetosphere protecting us, the Earth would resemble Mars be red in colour little with little atmosphere and no liquid water. And it's the liquid water in the oceans that cover 70% of the Earth, that's another magnetosphere, that allows the Earth to keep a relatively stable temperature and provides the conditions for Earth and water to combine and become charged with life. Now, life first developed in the exclusion zones around hydrothermal vents, which is the first interface between water and Earth when the Earth was young. Now, these hydrothermal vents were deep in the oceans where minerals from the Earth blended with geothermally heated water to create primordial soup in which helical EZ structures formed into the first strands of DNA, uh, RNA. Now, the evolution of life has since involved the development of more diverse and complex interfaces between water and Earth through the progressive encapsulation of exclusion zones. 
Now, I remember studying biology in the year that the, the series Life on Earth came out. And I couldn't wait each week for the next episode to appear. And where I learnt about how life had progressively separated itself from the environment while expanding Earth's habitats. Now, if you think about the Earth, the first organisms were anaerobes that evolved membranes to encapsulate an easy, rich cytoplasm. So these early prokary prokaryotes were then encapsulated into eukaryotes, which used the prokaryotes as organelles. And those organelles expanded, had expanded membranes and encompassed vastly expanded exclusion zone domains. The eukaryotes were then e evolved into multicellular organisms that then developed shells and scales and spines, which further expanded life's diversity and range. Vertebrates then progressed from the sea to the land to the air to everywhere and then to anywhere at all through the development of scales, skin, feathers, fur, and now technology, which can take us off planet. But how is life even possible? How does life defy the second law of thermodynamics and evolve greater complexity and order? It seems it does so by harnessing the properties of easy water and feeding on negative entropy while dissipating entropy to its surroundings. The evolution of life has harnessed the continual flux of high-grade energy from the sun, which provides more energy in one hour than humanity uses in a year, and stores it in cyclical, energetic loops. These backward-flowing eddies in the flux of entropy capture and store solar energy in the form of coherent EZ structures that create a bank of biological wealth that allows life on Earth to build up order and complexity and exist far from equilibrium. So this is from May Wan Ho, and it shows you that entropy overall increases, but you have this loop of coherent domains where there's no entropy production. That's the magic of life. And life does that by creating these reversible loops at all different dimensions. So we have a coherent whole while having um, autonomous at any one level. And we get an expansion and evolution of life without increasing capacity to dissipate entropy. So this whole structure can grow bigger as long as the dissipation of entropy increases, which it does at each stage of evolution. Now, the first prokaryotes fed off um, nutrient-rich waters from hydrothermal vents, and they used proton gradients from high-energy molecules. And these anaerobic cells built up a bank of organic material until cyanobacteria evolved that could feed directly off the sun and then use water as an electron donor to produce oxygen through the process of photosynthesis. And the switch from chemical to solar energy to convert the sun's um, energy into a bank of oxygen built up the atmosphere for nearly two billion years till it triggered a mass extinction event that wiped out most of the anaerobes and left the world with an oxygen-rich atmosphere along with an ozone layer and an ionosphere that protected the Earth from damaging solar radiation, thus enabling colonisation of the land. Since then, life on Earth has continued to capture and store the continual flow of energy in these... Oh. What happened there? What's going on? Thought it was dangerous to have embedded video. Apologies for this. Maybe we'll skip the video. So life creates, stores solar energy into these cycles, and these cycles occur in all time scales. Um, that actually all time and space scales that thermodynamically connect the modern ecosystems with life's ancient origins. Thank you. So I'll just. Now, perhaps the biggest EZ zones, let's try this again. If I click on that, hopefully this will work. Perhaps the biggest EZ zones on the planet occur under Antarctic ice. No, that's not going to work. That's OK. There's a, there's a fantastic video called Earth from Space by Nova, where this is documented. But what I'm going to describe is, is the biggest EZ zones on the planet under the Antarctic ice. As ice melts, or as it freezes, sorry, as the Antarctic ice freezes, we learned that ice goes through an EZ phase, so that excludes salt. So underneath the Antarctic ice, this dense, heavy brine, oxygenated brine, falls down. And apparently there's a waterfall that's 500 million times Niagara Falls, 
of dense brine water under Antarctic ice that's cold, dense, oxygenated. It falls down to the very bottom of the ocean floor and takes a couple of thousand years to circula circulate around the, the whole planet, which controls the planet's temperatures. But it also, at the very bottom of the ocean, meets hydrothermal vents, which are spewing out superheated um, water. It's supercritical, 400 degrees centigrade, that dissolves a lot of the Earth minerals. When that hits the oxygenated brine water, you get the formation of phosphates, nitrates, a whole lot of different nutrients that then flow up to the equator, hit the continental shelves, and have upwellings, which we've learnt about with Quinton water. And at that continental shelves, they provide the food for phytoplankton. And it's those phytoplankton which use the sun, and we often hear about you know, the phytoplankton produce all our oxygen from the sun, but they also need nutrients. And those nutrients are continually supplied by these hydrothermal vents created by this thermohaline circulation. So I highly recommend this video to watch that. And that's a, a, a snap from it. So similar cycles happen on land. Um, the biggest land-based easy water structures are the global rainforests. And these are the largest, oldest, and most diverse ecosystems on Earth. And the rainforests contain over 50% of all the world's species, and are literally forests of structured water that store and cycle massive volumes of water, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and other minerals in cycles that have gone on for hundreds of millions of years. Now, in pumping trillions of litres of water into the atmosphere every day through the so-called biotic pump, the rainforests drive global weather patterns. And these patterns produce desert storms in the, in the Sahara Desert, which has ancient seabeds. So these storms pick up millions of tonnes of ancient algae dust and shift them over to the Amazon, where they rain down as phosphate fertiliser. An amazing process. Now, the water vapour above the air in the rainforest, so the rainforests are pumping massive amounts of water, that, that helps to discharge the great potential difference between the ionosphere or the atmosphere and the, and the ground, which we've also learnt about, producing 90% of the world's lightning. Oh, that's a video there. This is a lightning map, and it shows that the lightning regions are really over the rainforest regions of the planet. Over 90% of the world's light, lightning occurs over these rainforest regions. And at a rate of about 40 to 100 lightning strikes per second. Now, this lightning fixes nitrogen. And again, the rainforest soils are quite depleted in nitrogen, but the lightning that it creates fixes nitrogen that rains down as nitrogen fertiliser on the rainforest. It also produces the global Schumann resonance. So it's a now, these Schumann resonance we've heard a little bit about, they occur between the ionosphere... Oh, five minutes, really? OK. So they, they act like a hammer hitting a bell. The whole Earth rings at... To, uh, about at these Schumann resonance frequencies, which happen to be the same frequencies as our EEG when we meditate. So these are Schumann resonances that can be found all over the Earth, uh, the spikes of the, the power grids. They've been the dominant frequencies um, since there's been an ionosphere, since life has evolved. And these are the correlations between EEG frequencies during meditation and these Schumann resonances. And because they correlate in the afternoon, you can actually look at your, look, look at your watch and work out what time it is and which which rainforest you're actually tuning into when you meditate. I, I learned about this in my um, PhD 20 years ago. I was studying acupuncture. And we put a, a broadband signal into one point. We actually found human resonance came out at the other point. And I was really instilled about the uh, resonance in general by my PhD supervisor, Irina Kosick, who um, has a resonance recognition model of protein-protein interaction, which can predict protein folding and um, biological function. And, and really shows that life actually cycles at, at different resonance that range from billions of a second to literally billions of years. Now, all living things must rely on the throughput of matter and energy. So you've got high energy coming from the sun, radiating out, low grade infrared out into the solar system with these different cycles that store that into the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, building up biological wealth. Even the, the business cycle is involved there. And you've got the, the lightning, which then creates this global human resonance. Now, throughout this whole process, life and water has retained a memory of its origins. 
So we have evidence from many areas that water has memory. Um, and while that's not fully accepted in all domains, what is accepted is life always comes from life. And we have this genetic um, history, and that within all of us, we have a genetic history that can be traced back four billion years to the last universal common ancestor. All of us also carry around within us, on us and around us, a living history of life's evolution in the form of an entire ecosystem of bacteria, fungi, archaea, protozoa and viruses that profoundly influence our health and well-being. Our bodies contain just as many bacteria as human cells, and our bowels, our breath, our body, along with our built environments and our bathing water, all contain microbial communities that help define us and play a ro vital role in our health and well-being. So we're all part of an unbroken chain in the evolution of consciousness that has led to an increase in complex and diverse interface between water and earth. Now these interfaces actually create wealth and are natural attractors from life. Humans have always settled at the interfaces of water and earth, near rivers, coastlines, natural wells, and access to water adds value to land. And the, the real estate market tells us this, where proximity to water, even a view of water, adds millions of dollars or huge value to property values. Um, architects now design these infinity edge pools to give us an artificial water horizon which adds value and a sense of luxury. But not only are the interfaces of water and earth natural attractors for life, they're actually the places we feel most alive. And I feel this in my own life and the life of my family and friends, but I think we all feel this. I mean, who doesn't love the beach? Who doesn't love to paddle, to raft, to, to shoot water, to skate? to surf, to ski, to snorkel, to snowboard, to dive, to slide, to jump, to hike, to climb, to build, to play, to relax, or even just to lie at the interface of water and earth. Even bathing outfits are fun. The interface between water and land can be beautiful and fun and exciting and provide a balance between gravity and levity that make us feel like we're living in heaven on earth. Now, of course, when you mix water and earth, you get mud. But while water may be divine, mud or water together with earth can be sublime. Yet while I love playing at the interface of water and earth, my search for wellness keeps me coming back to bathing and to geothermal springs, which I believe are the most wondrous places on earth. Geothermal springs are the birthplaces of life, it's my local one, and these hydrothermal vents, which form chimneys many stories high, can be considered the nipples of Mother Earth that continue to suckle all life on earth by providing nutrients, um, that feed phytoplankton and supply the global food chain and, and with oxygen and nutrients. Hydrothermal vents are seen not only, um, not only ensure the well-being of all life on Earth and the world's ecosystems, they're also sources of material wealth and they're responsible for laying down deposits of silver, copper, gold, zinc and other minerals required from human industry. Now the value of hot springs has long been recognised and hot springs are revered by all people and all cultures and, and places as, health, as places of health and rejuvenation. And the colonisation of much of Europe has been influenced by Roman bathing culture and the idea of health through water and spas as places of wealth is pervasive and forms the basis of the oldest and most sustainable place-based industry. There's actually a commercial onsen in Japan that's been operating for 52 generations in the same family for over 1,300 years, which is the world's oldest place-based business. And while they'd be amongst the oldest businesses, spas are also continual hubs of human innovation. I don't know of any other industry or business that has an interface of so many different areas of human enterprise, ranging from design, engineering, medicine, healing, hospitality, cuisine, food production, social activity and commerce. Hot springs not only inspire human innovation, they're also the innovation hubs for life. They continue to be the most diverse living environments on Earth and every hot spring is unique and together they include an incredibly wide range of temperature, pressure, chemical, mineral composition, Sorry, and home to a wealth of biodiversity in the form of extremophile bacteria. In fact, it's these bacteria that produce the thermostable DNA polymerase that we actually use to study the biological diversity. I'm actually currently using these techniques studying the biological diversity of hot spring water um, around the planet, and I hope to um, take a lot of samples while I'm here in, in Europe. Yet while it's nice to travel around the world visiting hot springs, the world's actually experiencing a water crisis. The industrialisation of the world has propelled humanity into an age of unprecedented prosperity and enabled the human population to reach or to, to approach 10 billion. Yet the belief that we're separate from the environment and that the solution to pollution is dilution has caused us to use the oceans and the air as entropy sinks 
leading to climate change and, clear, and making clean, flowing water a diminishing resource. We've also dramatically altered the distribution of Earth's biomass. 10,000 years ago, that was humans and our animals, 0.1%. Now humans and animals are 97%, with wild animals being 3%. This has led to us destroying almost half of the world's rainforests, with more than an acre of rainforest being destroyed every second. So we're actually in the midst of a mass extinction event, and conservative estimates suggest that within 100 years, all rainforests could be gone. So this anthropocentric worldview and a global financial system with perverse incentives has led us to rage a war on water, and even on life itself. We've soiled our water and we attempt to disinfect it with toxic chemicals. Our drinking water is treated with chlorine and contaminated with pharmaceuticals, persistent organic pollutants, heavy metals and industrial chemicals. We spray our food with pesticides, we clean our body with antibacterial agents, we dose ourselves and our animals with antibiotics. Many commercial hot spring operators even use chlor chlorine in their water, which is something I'm trying to address with my research. So environmental toxicity and climate change now affect every living thing on Earth. We're now floating in a sea of our own trash and many people are over their head. This actually affects all people and all life on Earth. We've even invented newer, actually, it's estimated there are five trillion pieces of plastic in the oceans, with some areas having 60 times more plastic than plankton, and it's estimated by 2050 there could be more plastic in the oceans than fish. We've also invented newer, longer-lasting ways to, to pollute the world. We have nuclear radiation, microbeads, nanoparticles, genetic pollution, magnifying our ability to, to dispense toxicity. So our modern lifestyles have led to environmental toxicity and habitat destruction that has plunged us into a global mass extinction event and led to a dramatic change in the trajectory of human disease. Cancer has now overtaken malnutrition and other diseases as the number one killer on Earth. Our current system of resource dis distribution that relies on linear processes that pollute our surroundings and concentrate wealth in a minority has also led to devastating wealth inequality. So that the world's 60th richest people owe, own just as much as the poorest half of the whole world's population. There's currently about 2 billion people living below the poverty line on less than $2 a day without access to adequate clean water or sanitation, with 2.3 billion people suffering from tuberculosis. Water poverty is one of the major factors holding back human development. Every day, women and girls spend 200 million hours just to gather water. We're at a critical juncture in time, and just as the great oxygenation event produced a mass extinction when bacteria moved from chemical to solar energy, we're in a phase of multiple positive feedback loops that are leading to runaway processes that could result in any number of global catastrophes. Yet I think our hearts know a more beautiful world is possible. Perhaps the most important thing I've learned in my lifelong quest for wellness is that wellness is about we, not I. I can't be well if my environment is toxic or if wealth inequality breeds social unrest and disease. My health and well-being is inextricably linked to the health and well-being of all people and all life on Earth. We're all connected through water. We're all in the same bath together. And while I've spent my life seeking wellness from an early age, I realise that water is much more fun when it's shared. Me up the back there. I find it tragic to live in a world where we can send spacecraft to Mars, yet it leaves one in three people on Earth unable to satisfy their most basic water needs. So while the need for, for change has never been so great, our tools have never been more powerful. Exponential technologies such as AI, net, network sensing, air casting, big data, cloud computing, um, and um, have, uh, these technologies have the potential to map wellness and well-being gradients and wealth gradients, locate sources of entropy and close the loop on our waste streams, and to develop policies and regulations that minimise entropy production and align global currencies with the currents of life. A great example of citizen science leading to global action is in the 1960s when um, citizen scientists collected 80,000 baby teeth from around the world and showed that those baby teeth after widespread um, nuclear testing had 50 times the strontium-90 levels from nuclear fallout. And this, this citizen science research led to the superpowers signing the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So this was achieved before the internet, social media, and it shows that people can really make a change if they, they have a common intention. And actually, water is the solution. I mean, it tells us that. So if we get water flowing well, wellness and wealth follow. 
we can look to the ultimate solvent to solve the world's water problems by treating the Earth's waters as, as a single flowing system. I therefore invite you and the global community to participate in the World Wellness Project that aims to facilitate citizen science projects that produce crowdfunded maps and metrics that transcend political boundaries and incentivize and gamify wellness while supporting the delivery of innovative grassroots initiatives that can deliver clean flowing water. It's certainly possible to end water poverty. There's many, many technological solutions. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to hope open them. But there are these incredible grassroots solutions that exist already that can provide clean water to all. We actually have the technology to turn the world into a paradise where everyone is well. It's estimated that $20 billion would do it, yet we spend $100 billion on plastic drinking bottles. So humanity's search for wealth has led to us to explore and exploit out of space and deep within the oceans and in the earth. Yet everywhere we seem to look, we find water. But in searching for riches through mining the asteroids or drilling into the Earth's mantle, we may be overlooking the richest resource we have, which is the water within us. Water has many unexplained anomalies and still harbours profound mysteries that offer the promise of endless energy, water purif purification, medicine, and harmony with the world's weather. St. Gorgi says that life is water dancing to the tune of solids. And I believe the melody that life is dancing to is what Mei Wan Ho calls quantum jazz, which forms a coherent whole that allows maximum local freedom and global cohesion. I believe we're in a turning point in the human evolution and we're awakening to a global consciousness where water connects us all in a web of wellness. Water is a blessing and I give thanks to water. And the water in me gives thanks to the water in you. Namaste. Thank you for your time.